Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us again today. Today with me uh, will be Dr. Joseph Canner. Uh, he's the Assistant State, State Health Officer. He will be available to answer any questions that you might have related to the testing and cases and so forth. Uh, I'm also joined by Dr. Gina Lagarde, who is a Regional Medical Director for Region 9, which is the North Shore uh, region and she will be making uh, remarks shortly. Today, we are reporting 1,345 new cases of COVID-19 for a total of 127,246 since the beginning. Those 1,345 cases are on, one th I'm sorry, 15,105 tests. I can tell you that 94% of today's cases uh, were from community spread, 6% were from congregant settings, and 94% of these cases were collected uh, in the past week. Those specimens were, were collected in the last week. Uh, tragically, uh, we've hit a milestone today on deaths. We have now surpassed 4,000 uh, fellow Louisianans who've died of COVID-19. Uh, we're reporting 50 new deaths today, and that brings the total to 4,028. And as we have done uh, numerous times uh, since this began, I think any time you hit a milestone, it's worth doing again, and that is just to remember. Everybody should pause and remember these are our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles. Uh, they're neighbors to all of us, and so please lift all of the family members of those who've died up in prayer. Uh, currently, we have 1,457 patients uh, in hospitals across the state of Louisiana with uh, COVID-19, and that is down 14 uh, since yesterday. Yesterday was down 16 since the day before. And what we've seen over the last nine or 10 days or modest but sustained improvements in our numbers related to tests, I'm sorry, cases, hospitalizations, uh, and positivity. I can tell you all of those still are unacceptably high, uh, but it beats the trajectory that we had been on uh, for several weeks and really going back to uh, the Memorial Day activities. So basically from the middle of May, uh, I'm sorry, the middle of, of June, uh, go, going forward, we're doing we're doing better, uh, but we've got some some work left to do. I can tell you that we recently completed the surge testing in East Baton Rouge Parish that was sponsored by uh, Health and Human Services, uh, our federal partners, uh, at 48 sites total. Um, there were 56,711 tests administered. Fixed sites will remain uh, in Lake Charles Lafayette and Alexandria while supplies last. Uh, and in New Orleans, surge testing is now open and, open and will continue past next Friday. Um, everyone who um, came to get tested uh, at these surge sites uh, were able to receive a mask and the Department of Health uh, took the opportunity to educate residents on how to protect themselves and their communities uh, from COVID. Also, because of this surge testing site, really the only testing of any size that we've had in Louisiana that was specifically uh, designed to allow individuals to test whether they were symptomatic or had been a close contact of someone who was COVID positive or asymptomatic, we actually uh, saw uh, many asymptomatic people come in and be tested and they found out that they were positive. And we would expect that to happen because the estimates are that somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of uh, individuals who get COVID will be asymptomatic. Now, by the way, that's one of the things that makes this particular public health emergency, this pandemic, so hard to manage and to control uh, because these asymptomatic people are much less likely to be tested, to know that they are both uh, infected and infectious and they will transmit the disease to, to others. Uh, which, by the way, is the very reason that we have a mask mandate in place. The mask is a proxy for a test result. There really isn't another way uh, to manage this disease and try to get on top of the numbers. Now, if you've had COVID symptoms or been exposed to someone with COVID, uh, please get tested. Uh, incredibly important. Call your doctor or call 211 to find a test site 
uh, near you. At this point in time, I'm going to ask Dr. Lagarde to come up uh, to share her observations uh, with you, and then I will come back up when she's completed. And I would ask you that if you've got questions for Dr. Lagarde, go ahead and ask those while she's at the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for having me here. I'm Dr. Gina Lagarde. I'm the Regional Medical Director for the Office of Public Health, Region 9, which consists of five North Shore parishes, and that's St. Tammany Parish, Washington Parish, Tangipahoa Parish, St. Helena Parish, and Livingston Parish. Collectively, we make up about 12% of the state's population. We have over 500,000 residents that call the North Shore home. And the North Shore consists of urban living and rural living. We have cities, towns, we still have villages, and we have over 60 unincorporated areas. It is good, it is nice living there, it's family oriented, excellent education system, but we still have COVID. COVID is widespread in the, on the North Shore in all five of our North Shore parishes. Regarding our numbers, are related to COVID cases and COVID deaths on the North Shore. Our cases and deaths represent about 10% of those for the state's cases and deaths. Regarding COVID incidents, all five of our parishes are higher than the federal threshold of 100 cases per 100,000 population. However, the good news is that the mitigation efforts that have been put in place with mandates and um, and some of our restrictions is showing that for all five of our parishes, the incidence of COVID is decreasing. And I've seen that over the last two weeks. With regard to percent positivity, three of our five parishes, uh, all five of our parishes are above the federal threshold of 10%. However, I'm hopeful because at least two of our parishes have shown a decrease in percent positivity. Again, showing that we are going in the right direction for those mitigation efforts that we have in place. Well, we do know, just like the state in our region, that uh, the age group that accounts for the, the most significant number of case increases is the 18 to 29 year old age group. Also, what we do know is that our hospitals uh, have capacity right now. They do have hospital beds. They do have adequate ventilators. They do have PPE. However, their biggest challenge is with staffing. Because again, when we have community spread, the people who work in the hospitals are exposed. And they are coming, and, and they too have fallen ill. And not all of it is just COVID. Again, keep in mind that, you know, with COVID, there has been fear for people coming to the hospital or seeing their doctors. And uh, so we still have to deal with the other illnesses that we usually see, in, you know, in our population. What I am hopeful in the, um, in the region, you know, we continue to work tire tirelessly to uh, test our, our constituents. And we work very closely with our parish leadership, with our parish president, our, uh, our police jury president, and with our Office of Emergency Preparedness Directors to find the best place for us to be able to offer the testing in all five of our, region, uh, all five of our parishes. It is becoming a challenge because, again, we do have some limitations with, um, you know, the, the amount of, of, uh, uh, of our, our uh, strike teams that we can that we will have. Right now we're working with uh, the National Guard and we're also partnering with our other community partners like Oxnard and LCMC to provide that service for community testing. Um, we did have two surge sites, one in Livingston Parish and one in um, Tangipahoa Parish and we were able to test over 1,400 of our residents there. Collectively, our community testing in, re in the region is uh, slightly over 9,100 tests performed. The average is about 178 uh, tests per day. What I would like to say, you know, we, we work very closely with our hospitals to ensure that they have what they need to deliver services. 
We work very closely with our leadership to ensure that the proper measures, mitigation measures are in place. I do want to highlight that we have, you know, community leaders like our uh, St. Tammany Parish, uh, Parish President, uh, Mr. Cooper, who just started recently a mask ask campaign. Slow the pace, cover your face. It's not too much to ask, wear a mask. And why do I say that? We know that wearing a mask is one of our most cost effective ways of reducing the spread of COVID. We know that the restrictions and the mandates that were in place have been put in place to prevent the spread of COVID. We are aware that these mandates may affect how we live, learn, work, worship, play, socialize with our families. But I think they are, ne they are necessary to control the spread of this disease. It's not gonna go away on its own. And it, it, it's a collective effort. It's not just what the individual does, but what we do collectively as a community to ensure that we work towards the, reducing the spread of COVID. This is my cousin Nadine. Um, vibrant. 63-year-old, just bought a new home, enjoying life, retired from Loyola at, at, with over 30 years of work experience, rejoined the workforce, productive. March 9th, I think, was the first time we had a case, a uh, PUI, in our, in our state. Seven days later, my cousin became symptomatic. She lived in New Orleans, and, but it was atypical symptomatology. It wasn't that traditional, you know, the typical triad of fever, cough, and difficulty breathing. That did come. Her presentation was GI. So for four days, she suffered with GI symptoms. Again, we didn't know that association with COVID at that time. About five days later, she was in the emergency room. The next day, she was intubated. And on April 3rd, she passed away. She passed away on her son's birthday and 23 days before her, her 64th birthday. You know, so when I hear, I, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that people, you know, with, with COVID that we've lost our sense of safety, our sense of control, our sense of security maybe. And for some, they, they feel they've lost their sense of freedom what I do know that masks work. And so when I hear people say, it is my right not to wear a mask. It is my right to congregate in large groups. What about my right to live? What about your right? I understand. It's about doing what we know is right, doing things right and doing the right thing. Wearing a mask might have saved my cousin. This was before we knew this. Reducing uh, large crowds, socially distancing may have saved my cousin. We do know from the contact tracing piece that we were able to possibly connect it to a gathering where others had symptoms of COVID at that time. That could have been it, or it could have been the exposure at work. However, we know that these mitigation efforts work. Masks, it's cheap, $5. The economic impact of that $5 mask, if worn properly to reduce the spread of COVID versus the cost of hospitalizations, the cost of death, the years of life lost. When you look at the workforce, the 18, and I'm going to say through 69-year-olds, even though I know, you know the typical retirement age was 65, but I'm going to bring it to 69, we had over 1,400 deaths. Those are years of life lost too soon. That was our workforce. Also, we, I know we talk a lot about the cases. We talk a lot about the deaths. For those that have had COVID, we know that some of them suffer from the sequelae. They still have issues with their heart, their lungs, their kidneys, their neurological system. There's a cost to that, especially to the healthcare system. We ask that 
you wear your mask. That's simple. We ask that you socially distance and not congregate in large crowds. That's easy. We ask that you, socially, that you physically distance at least six feet. How easy is that? We ask that you continue to wash your hands, to disinfect frequently touched surfaces. Better yet, stay at home. Better yet, stay at home if you're not well. Those are very, very simple asks to help to reduce the spread of COVID in our state. I wish my cousin had that opportunity to wear a mask. I wish, knowing what we know now, that we had uh, small group con you know, restrictions on how many people can gather. I wish that we knew about social distancing then. We may not have been able to save her because a lot, we've learned a lot about COVID from March 9th to now. The 4,000 deaths, Today? No. We, we can do better than that as a state. We can do better than that as citizens. I'm hopeful because our numbers are improving. It's showing that, that these, these mitigation measures are working. So please, what I'm asking is that we mask up, that we socially distance that we continue our hand hygiene, that we continue to disinfect surfaces, that we continue to stay home if we're not well. You know, I do worry. Our, our, our children are beginning school this week. They have the right to be able to go to school and, not, and the teachers and the staff and not have to worry about high cases of COVID in our community. Help us to help us. Thank you. Dr. Lagarde, thank you very much uh, for your work um, here in the state of Louisiana, particularly in, in Region 9. Um, and as she mentioned about these mitigation measures working, if you have any doubt, just, just look at the data. Um, and I know we had a long presentation in here uh, earlier this week uh, with Dr. B, but you can see that it was about two weeks after um, those additional mitigation measures were put into a place that we actually started turning around those numbers and started showing this modest improvement that has been consistent at least up to now. And one of the concerns that we have is when people hear that we're doing better, they think, well, because we're doing better, they don't need to follow the mitigation measures, when the fact is the only reason we are doing better is because we're getting more people to follow those mitigation measures. Uh, and now is absolutely not the time uh, to stop. We need more. Uh, participation and adherence not less because while we're seeing modest improvements what we know is if everybody wore the mask if everybody social distanced if everybody washed their hands if everybody stayed home when they were sick we would see much more dramatic uh, improvement in our numbers uh, and and you know I would remind everybody we remain red uh, under the uh, criteria of the White House coronavirus task force which looks primarily at cases uh, and at positivity. Um, some of you may be aware that today Judge Janice Clark upheld the critical measures that I put into place to slow the spread of COVID-19 to protect lives, to preserve hospital capacity, um, really to, to save the lives of Louisianans. Uh, this is not the last legal challenge um, that uh, has been away, uh, put in place, uh, but I'm confident um, that I am doing what is necessary, that we are following the science, that we are following the data, that we are implementing best practices and recommendations that come uh, from the White House Coronavirus Task Force and the CDC uh, and so forth, and that I'm doing it uh, pursuant to the authority I have as governor uh, to respond to this public health emergency uh, as uh, I'm authorized to do uh, by the Constitution 
and by statutory law here in Louisiana. And it's not just that I'm authorized to do it. Because we're talking about lives, I believe that I'm obligated uh, to do these things as well. Does it make it easy? I've gone through this with you all many times. Nothing easy about any of the work that we're doing, but it is absolutely essential. Uh, it is legal, and we now know without any doubt it is effective. That's not just, um, you know, some academic exercise. It's not theoretical. Uh, we know uh, that it works. Uh, we still have uh, significant work to do in Louisiana. You can see that we remain number one in the country in per capita cases. More than two and a half percent of our state's population uh, has been infected, uh, has had COVID-19. And again, that's just pursuant to the positive test results, the confirmed cases. Uh, we know that there are a lot more individuals than that who've had it, uh, but who have remained asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and have never uh, been tested. And we also know that if we want, and I think we do, um, if we want as much of our economy to be open as possible, but safely, is our schools, K through 12, higher education, open, but safe. If we want to be able to engage in as much uh, normalcy as possible, uh, it is these mitigation measures that are going to allow that to happen. Uh, and we can get to a transmission rate of less than one without having to go back to phase one or to stay at home, but it's going to require everybody doing their part. That's what the modeling shows. Um, and and we, we can do that. We're on that track now uh, if we can maintain it long enough to get to below one. But again, if everybody would do their part, we would see much more dramatic uh, results much more quickly. I also want to give you an update on Title 32 in Louisiana, um, which deals with the National Guard. Uh, and we are thankful that Title 32 will stay in place through the end of the year uh, for our National Guard. And we, we appreciate that very much. The National Guard has been a key part of our strategy. Dr. Lagarde mentioned them just a while ago when she was speaking. Um, and they, they have uh, done so many different things from uh, receiving and warehousing and, and distributing PPE and, and ventilators and doing testing, uh, going out uh, to nursing homes as part of strike teams, uh, assisting at food banks. I mean, you, you, you name it, mo mobile test sites all over uh, the state of Louisiana. So while we're happy to know that uh, the Title 32 will be continued through the end of the year, I was certainly disappointed to learn that uh, Louisiana and, and most states will have to pay 25% of the cost of the National Guard for the rest of the year, while two states, Texas and Florida, uh, were singled out and not to have to pay a cost share. Um, and I want to make sure you understand, I don't begrudge Texas and Florida. I'm not upset that they're getting 100% coverage. But I will tell you, there's not a rational basis to distinguish between Louisiana and those two states when we have ridden the crest of both the first surge and the second surge, as evidenced by the fact that we've had uh, more cases per capita than any other uh, state. And so I will be working through the congressional delegation and re-urging uh, the White House to, to uh, extend that 100% call share uh, for the National Guard uh, through the end of the year uh, here in Louisiana. Uh, and just so you know, um, if we continue to operate the National Guard um, as we have over the last several months through the end of the year, uh, the 25% call share is going to be about $2.5 million a month. And so it'll be a little more than, than $10 million is, is what we're talking about uh, through December the 31st. Um, so it's not an insubstantial amount uh, of funding. Uh, I also want to take a moment and talk a little bit about work search, uh, which has been implemented uh, by the Louisiana Workforce Commission. Um, and look, I understand there's a, some considerable anxiety out there because the um, extra $600 a week in federal uh, pandemic unemployment uh, benefits uh, has uh, expired. I know Congress is working 
uh, to see whether they can come up with a negotiated uh, compromise that would continue those benefits at least in, in some amount. But as of right now, they're over. Uh, we know that the state benefit is $247 a week, and people are simply not going to be able to survive on that. Uh, it is time to get those who can uh, back into a job uh, and to, to find work. And there are um, several thousand jobs available in Louisiana. And so that's, that's what we are uh, trying to do now uh, it, through the work search uh, requirement uh, where each week in order to recertify, uh, the individual is going to have to uh, share with the Workforce Commission the three employers that were contacted and that no um, jobs were available. Um, it, this also is being done because we are concerned about the solvency of the state's uh, unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, which we've talked about numerous times. Um, that tr trust fund started out uh, at the beginning of March with about $1.1 billion in it. It's down to $270 million today. Uh, we can't pay benefits if the fund is insolvent. The only two ways to keep it solvent, absent uh, some funding from Congress in Phase 4 of the um, assistance that, that they are, coronavirus assistance that they are negotiating right now, is to either uh, cross that threshold whereby the, the law imposes an increase on payroll tax on employers in order to replenish the fund, or you borrow money from the federal government, in which case you have to put a surcharge on employers in order to ensure the federal government, assure the federal government that you're going to be able to pay it back. Uh, either way, that's a, that's a tax increase or a functional tax increase. We don't want to do that. Um, and so we are, we are asking uh, for help from uh, uh, the congressional delegation. We're working through the National Governors Association and directly with the White House uh, in order to uh, get their assistance on this matter. Uh, but these, these work search requirements are back in place. Uh, they do not apply to individuals whose employment isn't available because of a restriction that has been imposed. Uh, because of COVID-19 or for an employee who actually has uh, COVID-19. So there are some exceptions to this, uh, to this work search uh, requirement. Um, and, you know, it, we do encourage people, however, as they are able uh, to do so, to reenter the workforce. Um, that's that's going to be critically important for them and, and their families, as well as um, the, the state's economy. And uh, let's see, I do want to remind people again that the census is going to end a month early. So September the 30th is the deadline uh, to respond to that. Uh, it's critically important that, that individuals do it. We have a response rate that lags the national average. Uh, and there will be a price to pay in Louisiana if we don't get more people to respond between now and, and um, September the 30th. So we're asking people to do that. It only takes a few minutes um, to make that happen. So with that, I'm going to pause and take your, oh, by the way, that's 2020census.gov. Go to 2020census.gov, or you can uh, call in at 844-330-2020 uh, in order to complete your census. Uh, and so now I'll take your questions. Sam? Governor, now that you've won in court today, do you have any plans to crack down on the barbecue restaurant in Denham Springs that continues to operate without a food permit? Yes. And what will you be doing exactly? Uh, we will share that with you when the time's appropriate. When will that be? When it's appropriate. <laughs> yes, anybody else? Uh, Linda? On the unemployment trust fund and the solvency discussion, um, uh, Senate President Paige Cortez said you all had had some conversations about the possibility of maybe using CARES Act funding if there is any left over. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be anything left over from um, either the business grant program or the local government program in a time period that could help keep the unemployment trust fund solvent? Yeah. Um, I don't see it on the uh, portion of the CARES Act that we've dedicated to local government. Um, there's a certain amount, if you remember, of the $1.8 we received, 
uh, it was my recommendation that consistent with the intent of Congress as expressed by our entire congressional delegation that 45% of the 1.8 billion be reserved for local government. Um, uh, the House more or less went along with that, but then did fund uh, $300 million for the Main Street program um, and an additional much smaller allocation for the frontline workers out of that. Uh, but what remains uh, in the local portion of that, we believe, um, based on our discussions with uh, local government and the, the filings that they have been making to the Division of Administration, that that will be completely exhausted. Um, and as for whether there will be money left in the Main Street program, I haven't received a report yet. In fact, I think it would be premature to guess because I don't think they're going to start issuing checks there until August the 15th. Uh, to qualifying businesses. I'm not sure how many applications they've received, how many of those applications will actually qualify, but we should have some uh, idea by the end of the month, I would suspect. Uh, that could potentially be in time uh, if there's additional funding there. Um, but if there's additional funding there, I mean, if you think about it, let's just say, and, and I have no reason to believe this, but half of that money is going to be available. That's $150 million. You've seen the trust fund go from 1.1 billion to 270 million since the 1st of March. And so that would not tide us over for very long. Um, and so the, the assistance that we need in phase four of the coronavirus relief that, that uh, is being negotiated right now is critically important for us. Uh, and uh, we, we certainly would hope that there would be enough money with enough flexibility that we could uh, replenish uh, the the uh, unemployment insurance trust fund with, with that money that would come there. And, we, and we're making sure we're communicating that uh, with our congressional delegation. Uh, and and uh, the speaker and the president and I have had a, num a number of conversations around different ways to replenish the, um, the trust fund because it, it's critically important. Nobody uh, wants to see employers have to pay more into into that trust fund, uh, but but let me let me just share with you another piece of news. On on uh, August the third, uh, we put twelve million dollars into the trust fund. That's that's the taxes that we got for the quarter. So it's twelve million dollars. I mean, it's just not enough to keep up with the demand with with the with the claims that are being made. Yes, ma'am. Uh, several other states have temporarily banned smoking in casinos because they're concerned people are taking their masks on and off when they're smoking in casinos. I was wondering if th that's been discussed at all in Louisiana. You know, that was discussed in Louisiana, as far as I know, just now, <laughs> when you brought it up. I haven't, I haven't heard that, um, and it, quite simply, you know, at first, uh, first impression, it seems to make uh, some sense, um, uh, but I, I hate to... Uh, hate to think out loud because sometimes you get into trouble, but I appreciate you bringing that up. And the question had to do with with whether we should temporarily ban smoking uh, at the casinos where it's not already banned. So I think uh, in New Orleans may be the only place, uh, but I know that Harris in New Orleans, uh, here, here in Baton Rouge as well, but a number of the casinos do not have a smoking ban in place. But in order to smoke, you, you obviously have to um, take your your mask on and off. Um, so that's something that I will give some consideration to and and talk to Mike Noel, the new chair of the Game Control Board. Yeah, but I'm not making an announcement today. I don't know. Yes, sir. Governor, you've uh, been hesitant to talk about LSU football. You said it's too early to speculate mm -hmm. on that sort of thing. I'm just wondering if you've had conversations with LSU leaders about the issue, or if you just haven't even started considering it or discussing it? No, I have. Uh, so I've had conversations directly with the athletic director. Um, and look, we all love, uh, well, I shouldn't presume to speak for everybody. I love, most people love LSU football, but this is actually broader than LSU because we have football programs across the state of Louisiana at, at our universities. Um, but I have had an opportunity to have very good discussions with the athletic director, Scott Woodward. And what I believe, and, and I think if you look at the entirety of what uh, Verge Osbury said the other day, um, they are planning for multiple contingencies uh, as to what they will be able to do safely in terms of uh, the number of spectators they can put in the stands for, for a football game. 
um, and, and they have a broad range of contingencies that they're planning for, and they don't know what that's going to look like yet. I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but, but the conversations uh, have started, um, and, and obviously you can't make the decision the day uh, of the game, um, but one of the things that we're going to have to do is get with LSU and other universities and figure out how far in advance of a home football game must they know what they're going to be allowed to do in order to be able to arrange for that. But in the meantime, in addition to how many people they can put in the stands, uh, they are looking at ways to get people in and out and into restrooms and out uh, without having them congregate unnecessarily in close proximity to one another, uh, how they can um, um, receive concessions um, without having to to get uh, uh, in line and that sort of thing. And all of that work is going to be helpful regardless, but we're going to have to see where we are in terms of our cases, our positivity, hospitalizations. All of those things will inform what we think we can safely do um, here in, in Louisiana when, when football resumes. And the good news is we do have some time because they backed up the start of the season. I think the first game is September the 24th now, at least at LSU. Yes, sir. A number of local bars are applying for temporary conditional restaurant licenses so they can continue to operate, keep the doors open to an additional capacity. From a public health standpoint, can you explain why a bar with a newly acquired temporary conditional restaurant license is safer than a bar that does not? It's, it's really simple uh, because they have to operate like a restaurant. All the rules that apply to restaurants today will apply to them in terms of the 50% occupancy the limit, the need to social distance uh, those people who are not in the same household. Uh, more than half of the income has to be derived from food sales, not alcohol sales. And so they would function exactly like a restaurant, which would make them safer. Uh, and by the way, that's another indication of, of the efforts that we're making uh, to allow as many of, of these bar owners as much flexibility as possible. So it wasn't just the, the ability to engage in sales for uh, pickup or drive-through. Uh, it wasn't just uh, leaving uh, or allowing them to have two video poker machines open if, in fact, they have those machines uh, in, their, in their place. Uh, but it is also allowing them to function as a restaurant if they're able to do that. And I can tell you they are being, those who, who meet the requirements and are asking for that uh, permit are, are receiving them very quickly so that they can, they can get into operation and start realizing some, some income just as soon as possible. But the reason that they will be uh, safer is because they will not be functioning as a bar uh, and all of their patrons will have to be seated in order to be served and, and so forth. Um, so. So it, it's, it's something that we're doing uh, in, in an effort, and by the way, working with um, the Resiliency Commission uh, Task Force on, on hospitality in order to, to, to do these things to allow as many of these establishments as possible to remain open, but to do so in a safe manner. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question is about, is there a protocol about higher education by campus on the number of cases? Um, you know, that's, that's a simplistic way to look at it. What I can tell you is they are working hard with the Department of Public Health, and also CDC is, is making um, uh, team members available uh, to work with education leaders, both K-12 through and higher education, to figure out what to do when there is a case. Um, and when there are multiple cases and, and so forth. Um, and I think we can all uh, assume that there will be cases. I mean, you can't, you can't have the cases that we have across Louisiana and then resume school and, and think you're not going to have some of those cases show up at your universities or your K-12 through schools. So it really depends upon, upon how many and whether they are in the same classroom or not, the same dormitory or not, but, but all, all of these things are being looked at. I can tell you that, that just recently our higher, edu 
education community completed tabletop exercises around all of that. And as a result of lessons learned there, they've actually gone back and revised uh, their plans for how they're going to open and operate and they will continue to do that as they learn from one another and as guidance may change from the CDC and so forth. Um, but but I would ask you to direct specific questions uh, about that either to the presence of the institutions or the systems or perhaps to uh, the Commissioner of, of Higher Education, Kim Hunter-Reed. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, and, and the re I'm not sure uh, what means we have to capture that information. Um, but but certainly, what we have, we will we will share. We're not we're not going to um, hide it from anybody. But I I want to make sure before I say yes, we're going to be sharing information. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to be able to capture that uh, through the means that we have in place to, to update you every day or whether there's going to have to be some additional things put in place or whether we would ask you to direct those questions to the particular uh, systems or, or universities uh, while we just report the universal numbers. And, and But we, we owe you an answer and we'll get that back to you. Yes, sir. where you would use your authority as governor to limit on-campus instruction? Well, I don't intend to have to do that because we know that K through 12 and higher education are doing everything they can to come up with a plan to deliver instruction that comports with the CDC guidelines. Um, and so I, that's just not something that, that I believe that I will, I will have to do. You know, uh, many uh, higher education students, especially those who are vulnerable, are going to be uh, participating um, uh, online. Uh, others will do a hybrid approach. Well, they'll be in if they have a Tuesday, Thursday class, for example. May, they may be physically present on Tuesday, but not on Thursday, so that the class is half as big as it would otherwise be, and then they will still hold that class in a room that is much larger than they would typically need, so that they can space. You know, so with all of the things that they have planned to do and, and with the mask mandate and so forth, I just don't believe it's going to be necessary for me to go in and overrule uh, what they're doing because the plans that they have come up with, they did it uh, working with the Department of Health. Um, and, and, and they did it in, in consultation with the CDC guidelines. Um, so I, don't, I just don't uh, believe that that's going to be necessary. Uh, I know she said last question, but but you've been patient. I want to. I want to. So in Shreveport, they um, seen the third of the minus and you're seeing a bunch of cases there. What's your response to that? Did you know about that? Okay, so I, I couldn't understand you. The third death of what kind? Oh, the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome for children. The third death. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I think the medical community, the scientific community, is really trying to figure out whether that is in fact um, uh, just what COVID looks like in certain kids. Um, you heard Dr. Lagarde a while ago talk about how we had certain symptoms early on um, that we were looking for for COVID and we didn't know that gastrointestinal problems were part of that and, and the symptomatology has actually grown over time. Um, there's a discussion right now in the medical community about whether this multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children is really just what COVID looks like in certain children who, who get the disease or whether it is a separate uh, 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 medical condition uh, that is somehow tangentially related to, to COVID. Uh, and you just indicated that Shreveport has seen their third death. Um, and we've had a, a number of deaths, and not not a, a, a big number, not like the the 4,000 that we've talked about from COVID, but a much much smaller number uh, from around the state. So we we obviously are concerned about that, uh, and it is further evidence, if you need it, that children are not immune from this disease. They are much less likely to have um, and uh, a serious. Uh, illness because of COVID-19, uh, but, but it still happens. It happens in, in smaller numbers 
uh, and in a lower percentage, uh, but it does happen. And, and, and we see sometimes a young person will get COVID-19 and have a bad result, even though there is no identifiable comorbid underlying condition. Um, and, and, and again, that's not the rule. That is very much the exception. But, but it is evidence that children are not immune, and so we need to make sure that they are uh, uh, as safe as possible, too, which is one of the reasons why the CDC guidelines as we go back to school are critically important, that these kids social distance, uh, that they have masks on, that they stay in their cohorts and they don't intermingle, that they don't go to the lunchroom with every student in the school, uh, that they don't do that at recess and, and, and so forth. Um, and that, that that starts from the moment a kid gets on the bus at 6.30 in the morning until the time they get back home. Uh, it's, it's critically important if we're going to be able to, to uh, safely and effectively resume school and, and, and get kids uh, back uh, in the classroom. Look, uh, thank you uh, all for, for continuing to cover this. It is, it is uh, obviously a very difficult public health emergency. Uh, one that, that is going to be with us for some time. Uh, unfortunately, there is a new normal, and the mask is part of that. Social distancing is part of that. Staying home when you're sick is part of that. Um, washing your hands and so forth. And so we're just asking everyone to do your part and to understand that the progress that we've started to see over the last 8, 9, 10 days is positive, but we can lose it. If, if we do what we did after Memorial Day, we will lose it. And on the other hand, if more people will comply with the mitigation measures in place, we will actually accelerate the improvements that we're making and they'll be long lasting. Uh, and we can get to a transmission rate of less than one so that the disease in Louisiana is on the way out uh, if we will just all engage in these measures. And we can do it without being more restrictive in terms of uh, the businesses that are open and the occupancy limits and, and all of those sorts of things. So we've got a long way to go, uh, but I'm optimistic we're going to get there. Uh, we flattened the curve once before. We're starting to do it again. Uh, now we just need to double down on these proven effective mitigation measures and restrictions. Uh, and if we can just all do that, uh, we're going to be in much, much better place. And we will have fewer people getting the disease, fewer people going to the hospital, and we will have fewer people dying. And that's, that's the quintessential way to be a good neighbor, is to just do something that is a modest request uh, of you, uh, that that's hardly constitutes a burden at all, uh, if it means that fewer people get sick and fewer people die. And it's just masking up. So thank you, and we'll see you on Tuesday.